Each day, we live and work in unique personal spheres. Some are familiar or traditional, some surprising and unorthodox. But facing new challenges means that nothing stays the same forever. It's time to stop feeling stuck in our circles and work harder to connect them. Technology makes things faster, easier, and more possible. Automation helps change how we do business, so we don't have to be afraid to embrace change to achieve our goals. It's time to adapt, innovate, and overcome together. It's time to bridge where you are to where you want to go. Are you ready to connect, create, innovate, and automate? Ansible Fest 2020. Automate to connect. Welcome to day two of the Ansible Fest virtual experience. I'm Katie Piccarelli, Senior Manager, Product Marketing for Ansible Automation here at Red Hat. From wherever you are, thank you for joining us. If you're joining us for the first time, we're glad you're here. We don't want you to miss anything. So just a reminder that all sessions will be available on demand through October, 2021. Be sure to tell your colleagues to check it out. Yesterday, we heard announcements about how Red Hat is connecting traditional container and edge platforms through automation. The ability to enhance automation across hybrid environments by integrating Ansible Automation and OpenShift with perhaps the only automation and container platform solution that is truly infrastructure agnostic. This integration will allow customers to identify and enforce policies, apply consistent governance models, and deploy and scale complex applications across hybrid multi-cluster environments. Today, you will hear from Matt Jones, Automation Platform Architect. He's going to dive into the more technical details of this integration and what engineering and product teams are doing to build the future versions of the Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. For the first time at Ansible Fest, Chris Wright, Red Hat's Chief Technology Officer, will be joining us. He will be talking about the rise of edge computing and 5G and how open source automation can help. We are excited to have him here. In addition to our two keynotes, our customer spotlights will include T-Mobile and PRA Health Sciences. And before the day ends, you won't want to miss the demo from Dylan Silva. He will be demoing the architectures that Matt Jones talks about and how that will help you better deliver on your end-to-end -end automation goals. We know that two full days is a long time to connect virtually. So remember to build your day within the environment and then take note of what you'd like to come back and check out later when it's all on demand. Well, if you thought day one was awesome, let's get started with day two. It's time, let's automate to connect. If you wanna innovate, you must automate at the edge. I'm Chris Wright, Chief Technology Officer at Red Hat, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So welcome to day two of Ansible Fest 2020. Let me start with a question. Do you remember 3G? when you first experienced mobile data connections, the first time that internet on a mobile device was available to everyone. It took forever to load a page, but it was something entirely different. It was an exciting time. And then came 4G, and suddenly data connections actually became usable. Together with the arrival of smartphones, people were suddenly online all the time. The world around us changed immensely. Fast forward to today, things are changing yet again. 5G is entering the market. And it's an evolution that brings about fundamental change of how connections are made and what will be connected. Now, it's not only the people anymore who are online all the time, devices are entering the stage, sensors, industrial robots, cars, maybe even the jacket you're wearing. And with this revolutionary change in telecommunications technology, another trend moves into the picture, the rise of edge computing. And that's what I'll be focusing on today. So what is edge computing exactly? Well, it's all about data, specifically moving compute closer to the producers and consumers of data. Let's think about how data was handled in the past. Previously, everything was collected, stored, and processed in the core of the data center. Think of server racks, one after the other. This was the typical setup, and it worked as long as the environment was similarly traditional. However, with the new way devices are connected and how they work, we have more and more data created at the edge and processed there immediately. Gathering and processing data takes place close to the application users and close to the systems generating data. The fact that data is processed where it is created means that the computing itself 
now moves out to the edge as well, outside of the traditional data center barriers into the hands of application users, sometimes literally into the hands of people. Look at your smartphone next to you as one good example. Data sources are more distributed. The data is generated by your mobile phone, by your thermostat, by your doorbell, and data distribution isn't just happening at home, it's happening in businesses too. It's at the assembly line, high on top of a cell tower, by a pump deep down in a well, and at the side of a train track every few miles for thousands of miles. This leads to more distributed computing overall. Platforms are pushed outside the data center. Devices are spread across huge areas in inaccessible locations, and applications run on demand close to the data. Often, even the ownership of the devices is with other parties, and data gathering and processing is only partially under our direct control. That is what we mean by edge computing. And why is this even interesting for us, for our customers? To say it with the words of a customer, edge computing will be a fundamental enabling technology within industrial automation. Transitioning how you handle IT from a traditional approach towards a distributed computing model like edge computing isn't necessarily easy. Let's imagine how a typical data center works right now. We own the machines, create the containers, run the workloads, and carefully decide what external services we connect to and where the data flows. This is the management sphere we know and love. Think of your primary OpenShift cluster, for example. With edge computing, we don't have this level of ownership, knowledge, or control. The servo motors in our assembly line are black boxes, controlled only via special APIs. The small devices next to our train tracks run an embedded operating system, which does not run our default system management software. And our doorbell is connected to a cloud, which we do not control at all. Yet we still need to be able to exercise control. Our business processes suddenly depend on what is happening at the edge. That doesn't mean we throw away our ways of running the data centers. In fact, the opposite is true. Our data centers are the backbone of our operations. In the data center, we still tie everything together and run our core workloads. But with edge computing, we have more to manage. To do so, we have to leave our comfort zones and reach into the unknown. To be successful, we need to get data, tools, and processes under management and connect it back to our data center. Let's take train, train tracks as an example. We're in charge of a huge network, thousands of miles of tracks zigzagging across the country. We have small boxes next to the train tracks every few miles, which collect data of the passing trains, takes, cares of the, takes care of signaling, and so on. The train tracks are extremely rugged devices, and they're doing their jobs in the coldest winter nights and the hottest summer days. One challenge in our operation is if we lose connection to one box, we have to stop all traffic on this track segment. No signal, no traffic. So we reroute all other traffic, passengers, cargo, you name it, via other track segments. And while the track segments now suddenly have unexpected traffic, congestion, and so on, we have sent a maintenance team to figure out why we lost the signal, do root cause analysis, repair what needs to be fixed, and make sure it all works again. Only then can we reopen the segment. As you can imagine, just bringing a maintenance team out there takes time. Finding the root issue and solving it also takes time. And all the while, traffic is rerouted. This can amount to a lot of money lost. Now imagine these little devices get a new software update and are now able to report not only signals sent across the tracks, but also the signal quality. And with those additional data points, we can get to work. Subsequently, we, see, we can see trends, and the device itself can act on these trends. If the signal quality is getting worse over time, the device itself can generate an event. And from this event, we can trigger follow-up actions. We can get our team out there in time investigating everything before the track goes down. Of course, the question here is, how do you even update the device in the first place? And how do you connect such an event to your maintenance team? There are three things we need to be able to properly tie events and everything together to answer this challenge. First, we need to be able to connect through the last mile. We need to reach out from our comfort zones down the tracks and talk to a device running a special embedded OS on a chip architecture we don't have in our data center and we have thousands of them. 
we need to manage at the edge in a way suited to its scale. Besides connecting, we need the skills to address our individual challenges of edge computing. While the train track example is a powerful image, your challenge might be different. Your boxes might be next to an assembly line or on a shipping container or a unit under an antenna. Finally, the edge is about the interaction of things without our data center or humans in the equation at all. As I mentioned previously, in the end, there is an event generated by the little box. We have to take the event and first increase the signal strength temporarily between this box and the other boxes on either side to buy us some more time. Then we ask the corporate CMDB for the actual location of that box, put all this information into a ticket, assign the ticket to the maintenance team at high priority to make sure they get out there soon. As you can see, our success here critically depends on our ability to create an environment with the right management skills and technical capabilities that can react decentrally in a secure and trusted way. And how do we do these three things? With automation. Yeah, it might not come as much of a surprise, right? However, there is a catch. Automation as a single technology product won't cut it. It's tempting to say that an automation product can solve all these problems. Hey, we're at a tech conference, right? But that's not enough. Edge computing is not simple, and the solution to the challenges is not simply a tool where we buy three buckets full and spread it across our data center and devices. Automation must be, must be more than a tool. It must be a process, constantly evolving, iterating on and on. We only have a chance if we embed automation as a fundamental component of an organization and use it as a central means to reach out to the last mile. And the process must not focus on technology itself, but on people, the people who are in charge of the edge IT, as well as the people in charge of the data center IT. Automation can't be a handy tool that is used occasionally. It should become the primary language for all people involved to communicate in. This leads to a cooperation and common ground to further evolve the automation. And at the same time, ensure that the people build and improve the necessary skills. But with the processes and the people aligned, we can shed light on the automation technology itself. We need a tool set that is capable of doing more than automating an island here and a pocket there. We need a platform powerful enough to write the capabilities we need and support the various technologies, devices, and services out at the edge. If we connect these three findings, we come to a conclusion. To automate the edge, we need a cultural change that embraces automation in a new and fundamental way. As a new language, integrating across teams and technology alike. Such a unified automation language speaks natively with the world out there as well as with our data centers at any scale. And this very same language is spoken by domain experts, by application developers, and by us as automation experts to pave the way for the next iteration of our business. And this language has the building blocks to create new interfaces, tools, and capabilities to integrate with the world out there and translate the events and needs into new actions, being the driving motor of the IT at the edge and evolving it further. And yes, we have this language right here, right now. It is the Ansible language. If we come back to our train track one more time, it is Ansible that can reach out and talk to our thousands of little boxes sitting next to the train tracks. The Ansible language, the domain experts of the boxes can natively work together with the train operation experts and the business, intelligent pe uh, business intelligence people. Together, they can combine their skills to write workflows in a language they can all understand and where the deep down domain knowledge is encapsulated away. And the Ansible platform offers the APIs and components to react to events in a secure and trusted way. If there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this, it is edge computing is complex enough, but luckily we do have the right language, the right tools, and here with you, an awesome community at our fingertips to build upon it and grow it even further. So let's not worry about the tooling. We have that covered. Instead, let's focus on making that tool great. We need to become able to execute automation anywhere we need, at the edge, in the cloud, in other data centers. In the end, just like serverless functions, the location where the code is actually running 
should not matter to us anymore. Let's hear this from someone who is right at the core of the development of Ansible. Over to Matt Jones, our automation platform architect. Welcome back to Ansible Fest. I'm Matthew Jones. I'm the architect of the Ansible automation platform. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about what we've got coming in 2021 and some of the things that we're working on for the future. Today, I really want to cover some of the work that we're doing on scale and flexibility and how we're going to focus on that for the next year. I also want to talk about how we're going to help you grow and manage and use your content on the automation platform. And then finally, I want to look a little bit beyond the automation platform itself. So last year, we introduced Ansible content collections. Earlier this year, we introduced the Ansible automation hub on Red Hat Cloud. And yesterday, you heard Richard mention on-prem private automation hub that's coming later this year. And Automation Hub, Ansible Tower, this is really what the automation platform means for us. It's bringing together that content with the ability to execute and run and manage that content. That's, that's really important. And so what we really want to do is we want to help you bring Red Hat and partner content that you trust together with community content from Galaxy that you may need and bring this together with content that you develop for yourself, your roles, your collections, the automation that you actually do. And we, we want to give you control over that content and help you curate that content and build a community around your automation. We want to focus on a seamless experience with this automation from Ansible Tower and from Automation Hub for the automation platform itself and make it accessible to the automation and infrastructure that you're managing. Now that we've talked about content a little bit, I wanna talk about how you run Ansible. Today in Ansible Tower, use virtual environments to manage the actual execution of Ansible. And virtual environments are okay, but they have some drawbacks. Uh, primarily, they're not very portable. It's difficult to manage dependencies and the version of Ansible. Sometimes those dependencies conflict with the other systems that are on the, on the infrastructure itself, even Ansible Tower. So what we've done is created a new system that we call execution environments. Execution environments are container-based. And what we're doing is bringing the flexibility and portability of containers to these Ansible 
execution environments. And the, the goal really is portability. And we want to be able to leverage the tools that the community develops, as well as the tools that Red Hat provides to be able to produce these container images and, and use them effectively. At Ansible, we've developed a tool called Ansible Builder. Ansible Builder will, el will let you bring content collections together with the version of Ansible and Red Hat's base, uh, base container image so that you can put together your own images for execution environments. And you'll be able to host these on your own private registry infrastructure. If you don't already have a container registry solution, Automation Hub itself provides that registry. The idea here is that unlike today where your virtual environments and your, your production execution environments diverge a little bit from what your developers, your content developers, and your automation developers experience. We want to give you the same experience between your production environments and your development environments, all the way through your test and validation workloads. Red Hat's also going to provide some pre-built execution environments. We want to have some continuity between the experience that you have today on Ansible Tower and what you'll have next year once we bring execution environments into production. We want you to be able to trust the Ansible, the version of Ansible that's running on the, your execution environments and that you have the content that you expect. At the same time, we're going to provide a version of the execution environment that's just the base execution environment. All it has is Ansible in it. This will let you take those using Ansible Builder, take the collections that you've developed that you need in your automation and combine them without having to bring in things that you don't need or that you don't want in your automation and build them together in, into a very opinionated uh, container image. Uh, if you're interested in execution environments and you want to know how these are built, uh, and how you'll use them, we actually have them available for you to use today. Shane McDonald and Adam Miller are giving a talk later where they'll walk through how to build execution environments and how you'll use them. You can use this to make sure that you're ready for execution environments coming to the automation platform next year. Now that we've talked about how, how we build execution environments, I wanna talk about how execution runs in your infrastructure. So today, when you deploy Ansible Tower, you're deploying a monolithic web application. Your execution capability is tied up into how you actually deploy Ansible Tower. This makes scaling Ansible Tower and your automation workloads difficult, and everything has to be co-located together in the same data center. Isolated nodes solve this a little bit, but they bring about their own sort of opinionated challenges in setting up SSH and having direct connectivity between the control nodes and the execution nodes themselves. We want to make this more flexible and easier to use. And so one of the one of the things that we've created over the last year and that we've been working on over the last year is something that we call Receptor. Receptor is an overlay network that's an automation mesh. And the goal here is to separate the execution capability of your Ansible content from the control plane capability where you manage the web infrastructure, the users, the role-based access control. We want to we draw a line between those. We want you to be able to deploy execution environments anywhere. Chris Wright earlier today mentioned Edge. Well, Edge, Cloud, we want you to be able to manage data centers anywhere in the world. And you can do this with the automation mesh. The automation mesh connects your control plane with those execution nodes anywhere in the world. Another thing that the that the automation mesh brings is we're gonna we're gonna be able to draw lines between the control plane themselves and each automation mesh node. This means that if you have an outage or a problem on your network and on your infrastructure. If you can draw a line between the control plane itself and the node that needs to execute this Ansible work, the automation mesh can route around problems. The automation mesh and the way it's deployed also allows this to fit closer with ingress and egress policies that you have between your infrastructure. It doesn't matter which direction the automation mesh itself connects in. Once the connection is established, automation will be able to flow from the control systems to the execution nodes and get responses back. 
Now, this all works together with Automation Cloud. The content collections that we mentioned earlier, the execution environments that we were just talking about, and your container registries, all of these work together with the with these automation mesh nodes. They're very lightweight and very simple systems. This means you can scale up and scale down execution capacity as, it, as, as your needs increase or decrease. You don't need to keep around a lot of extra capacity just in case you automate more, just because you're not sure when your execution capacity needs will increase and decrease. This fits into an automated system for scaling your infrastructure and scaling your execution capacity. Now that we've talked about the content that you use to manage and how that execution is performed and where that execution is conform is performed. I want to look a little bit beyond the actual automation platform itself. And specifically, I want to talk about how the automation platform works with OpenShift and Kubernetes. Now, we have an existing installer for Ansible Tower that, that will deploy to OpenShift and Kubernetes. And we support OpenShift and Kubernetes as a first-class system for deploying Ansible Tower. But I mentioned Automation Hub and Ansible Tower as this is what the automation platform is for us. So we want to take that installer and replace it with an operator-based full lifecycle approach to deploying and managing the automation platform on OpenShift. This operator will be available in Operator Hub, so there's no need to manage complex YAML files that represent the deployment. Since it's available in Operator Hub, you have one place that you can go to manage deployments, upgrades, backup, and restore. And all of this works seamlessly with the container groups feature that we introduced last year. But I want to take this a little bit beyond just deploying and upgrading the automation platform from the operator. We want to look at what other capabilities that we can get out of those operators. So beyond just deploying and upgrading, we're also creating resource operators and CRDs that will allow other systems running in OpenShift or Kubernetes to directly manage resources within the automation platform. These will, anything from triggering jobs and getting the status of jobs back, we want to enable that capability if you're using OpenShift and Kubernetes. The first place we're starting with this is Red Hat's Advanced Cluster Management System. Advanced Cluster Management brings together the ability to manage OpenShift and Kubernetes clusters, to install them and manage them, as well as applications and products in managing the life cycle of those across your clusters. So what we really want to do is give you the ability to connect traditional and container-based workloads together. You're already using the Ansible automation platform to manage workloads with Ansible. When using advanced cluster management and OpenShift and Kubernetes, now you have a full system. You can manage across clouds, across clusters, anywhere in the world. And this sort of brings me back to, to one, of the, one of the areas of focus is for us. Our, our, our end goal is com our goal is complete end-to-end -end automation. We want to connect your people, your domains, and the processes. We want to help you deliver for you and your customers by expanding the capabilities of the Ansible automation platform. And we want to make this a seamless experience to both curate content, control the content for your ex for your organization, and run the run the content and, and run Ansible itself using the full suite of the Ansible automation platform. So the advanced cluster management team is giving a talk later where you'll actually be able to see advanced cluster management and the Ansible automation platform working together. Don't forget to check out Adam and Shane's talk on execution environments, how those are built and how you can use those. Thank you for coming to Ansible Fest and we'll see you next time.